When we come to Psalm 35, we see that the title of it in the Hebrew, and by the title I mean those brief few words that in many Psalms, not all of them, come before the first verse in English translations. Some of the translations in other languages include them as the first verse. But here in the English translation, the New King James Version, Psalm 35 begins with this phrase. Again, it's in the original Hebrew, a Psalm of David. Now, we know, of course, that this was the author of the Psalm, David, the son of Jesse, the man who became the king of Israel, uh, the man who slew Goliath the giant, uh, the man who was called the sweet psalmist of Israel in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Psalm 35 is interesting because it's the first in the collection of psalms of what is commonly known as an imprecatory psalm. Uh, imprecatory psalms, that's sort of a theological or fancy word for um, violent or cursing psalms, perhaps is a good way to describe them. In imprecatory psalms, in very strong terms, God is asked to defeat and to destroy the enemies of his people. What's interesting about the imprecatory psalms is, man, they they ask God, go get them, and we're going to see this in Psalm 35. But it is kind of interesting that the imprecatory psalms seem to increase in a strength throughout the collection of psalms. I think I might have said that this is the first of the imprecatory psalms. It's not. Psalm 7 is the first, and perhaps it is the mildest of the imprecatory psalms, where you'll see Psalm 35 is a little stronger. And uh, by the time you get to the last of the imprecatory psalms in Psalm 109, some people count at least 30 curses in Psalm 109 over the enemies of God and his people. Now, we know this was a psalm of David, but it is difficult to assign this psalm to any particular period of David's life. However, the phrasing of the very first lines of the psalm are similar or is similar to what David said to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 15, one of these times when David is a fugitive from King Saul and he made an appeal to him. Perhaps it's linked with that period of David's life But to be honest, uh, we can't say with certainty because Psalms 35 just doesn't give us a certain linking point for any of a life, any point in the life of David. So here we come now, Psalm 35. Let's take a look at the first three verses. We read this. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Take hold of shield and buckler, and stand up for my help. Also draw out the spear, and stop those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. What a beautiful plea to God we find in these first few verses. First, we find David in the first line of the song, Plead my cause, O God, with those who strive with me. Um, many adversaries fought against David. And there were many times when he prayed, Lord, fight with those or fight against those who fight against me. And David could rightly pray this prayer. David was a man who generally lived in God's will. And generally speaking, not exactly in every situation, but generally speaking, those who fought against David were also opposing God in his will. It's kind of interesting that we see here in verse 1 the phrase, with those who strive with me, according to Willem van Gameren. And by the way, you could find Willem van Gameren's commentary on the Psalms in the Expositor's Bible commentary. Uh, He writes the section in that commentary on Psalms. And I find it to be quite a good commentary. But van Gameren says that the verb for strive there is a legal term. And it's frequently used among the prophets uh, when they sort of bring Israel to court, so to speak. Uh, Charles Spurgeon cited a man named Cresswell who said this, more literally, litigate, O Lord, with them that litigate against me. Contend against them that contend with me. Uh, So that's what he's saying there in verse 1. Plead my cause, O Lord, with those who strive with me. Now in verse 2, take hold of shield and buckler and stand up for my help. David's using very vivid images to call upon God, God, Put on your armor and fight on my behalf. Uh, 
Now, we don't often think of God having armor, but he does. You know that phrase in Ephesians chapter 6 where it says, put on the whole armor of God. Now, normally we think the, the armor of God, that means the armor God supplies, and I suppose that's true. But it's also true that God himself has armor. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 17 says this, of the Lord. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. Now, you hear echoes of that, of Paul's description of the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. But he's drawing it from that essential idea that God himself has armor. And he's just kind of making that position. God is a warrior. He wants to fight on behalf of his own. So he needs to come out with his armor. And the two things he seems to describe here are two types of shield. Again, back to William Van Gemeren. He, he describes the first one as being a small shield, a magen, and then a buckler. That in Hebrew is a sena, a large, possibly a rectangular shaped shield that could be carried by a armor bearer or a shield bearer. And then again, he also has, as we see, a um, spear and a javelin there in verse 3. So here we find, get out the armor. Verse 3 says, draw out the spear. You know, the shield and the buckler are primarily defensive weapons, but David calls upon God to take the offense for him. I'm going to find protection behind your shield, behind your buckler. I'm going to ask you to keep your enemies at a distance from me using your spear. And so we see the Lord armed on behalf of his people as as if he's he's giving consolation to those he loves but he's there ready to fight against the enemies of his people it's really a very dramatic picture there god saying please defend me and and then lord please don't you love this line in verse 3 lord say to my soul i am your salvation it's as if david needed to hear it again and again and again he needed to hear it in his soul say to my soul i am your salvation Lord, you are my salvation, no one else. David understood he was not his own salvation. The, the world wasn't going to be a savior. Some politician wasn't going to be a savior. No, the Lord was his salvation. And you need to be constantly reminded of that. You know, that, that whole phrasing here in the first three verses really is very suggestive of David's assurance. Now, we see David very assured here. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. But doesn't that imply for us that David had his doubts? Yet, David was not content when he had his doubts. He said, no, I've got my doubts, but I'm going to speak the truth to my doubts. And so David knew, go to the Lord, get, get some assurance from a divine source, make it very deep and personal to my soul, and let it be right now. Say to my soul, I am am. You're not, I will be your salvation, though that's true too. But David needed to know it in the present tense, right here, right now. What a beautiful, powerful thing we find in these first three verses. Now, here in verse four, we're going to get to the imprecatory portion of this psalm, or at least one of them, where David is going to pray for destruction upon his enemies. Take a look at this, starting at verse four. We read this. Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. Let those be turned back and brought to confusion who plot my hurt. Let them be like chaff before the wind and let the angel of the Lord chase them. Let their way be dark and slippery and let the angel of the Lord pursue them. For without cause they have hidden their net for me in a pit, which they have dug without cause for my life. Let destruction come upon him unexpectedly and let his net that he has hidden catch himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. Wow. Here in verses four through eight, David speaks in the strongest terms, Lord, get them, carry out your vengeance upon them. He kind of begins with this phrasing in verse four, let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. David asked God, not only to protect him, but also to vindicate him. He wanted it to be seen. He wanted it to be known that he really did serve and obey the God, oh, God of Israel, I should say, and that those who opposed him would be made, look at that phrase, like chaff in the wind. 
That's it. They're just like chaff. They have no substance. They cannot stand. Lord, would you please bring them to shame and dishonor? Now, I I like what Charles Spurgeon said about this. He said something I think very appropriate and eloquent. He said this, Viewing sinners as men, we love them and seek their good. But regarding them as enemies of God, we cannot think of them with anything but detestation and a loyal desire for the confusion of their devices. No loyal subject can wish well to rebels. Squeamish sentimentality may object to the strong language here used, but in their hearts, all good men wish confusion to mischief makers. And that's exactly what David is praying here. Lord, put them to shame, bring them to dishonor, bring them to confusion who plot my hurt. Matter of fact, he says there in verse six, did you notice it? Let the angel of the Lord chase them. For emphasis, David repeats that idea twice. In verse six, let the angel of the Lord chase them. Now in verse six, again, let the angel of the Lord pursue them, both in verses five and six. What's interesting about that is, as you kind of chart the use of this phrase, the angel of the Lord throughout the Old Testament, you see that almost every time it's referring to a pre-incarnate expression of Jesus Christ. In other words, an appearance where the angel of the Lord appears in the Old Testament. It's, It's God appearing, and if it's God appearing in some kind of human form, it's a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And what's interesting about this is knowingly or not, David here called upon God the Son for his help. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is right here as the angel of the Lord. And as Jesus is the savior of the world, and as Jesus says to himself in the Gospel of John, he will also judge the world. Notice this. The angel of the Lord, Jesus Christ himself, is either our salvation or he is our judgment, our doom. This is a heavy thing for us to think about, but it's true. Now, David understood that his enemies were deserving of judgment because of the way that they attacked him. Look at the emphasis here that he says it twice, that they did it without cause in verse 7. For without cause, they have hidden their net uh, for me in a pet, in a pit. Twice, he repeats that idea that they came against him without cause. Now, David clearly sees himself here as being in the right. There's no doubt about that. And we understand that it's easy to be too confident in our own blamelessness. And many people have repeated the sense of David's prayer without being blameless. Oh, Lord, I'm better than my enemies. Oh, Lord, judge them. But but they haven't really been right. Not before God, not in their own hearts. Yet, yet, nevertheless, David could rightly pray, understanding that those who came against him did so without cause. Therefore, he prays in verse 8, Let his net that he has hidden catch himself. David prayed that the guilty one would truly be caught by the trap set for himself. And, and, and the guilty one was his adversary. David prayed that destruction would come upon the adversary suddenly, unexpectedly, and in a sense by his own net that he has laid for others. Now, David said this against enemies that were no doubt material. They were actually men seeking his life. But we can pray on the same principle against our spiritual adversaries. That is the principalities and powers that battle against us in the spiritual realm. The, the devil has snares. You'll find that in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and 2 Timothy chapter 2. The devil has strategies. You'll find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. He has snares and strategies that are set against us. And we may rightly pray that the devil himself would be caught in and caught by his own snares and his strategies. And that's something that I pray from time to time in this sense of spiritual warfare. Lord, whatever snare, whatever strategy that the Lord, excuse me, that Satan has set in this situation, Lord, would you please come against him and cause him to be caught in and by his own snare, his own strategy. Now, David sort of 
unburdened his soul in verses four through eight, asking God to get his enemies. Now he's going to declare some praise. Verse nine, and my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in his salvation. All my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you, delivering the poor from him who is too strong for him? Yes, the poor and the needy from him who plunders him. You see, after pleading to God for deliverance and protection, David then promised that his soul would be appropriately happy in the Lord. Verse 9, my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. Matter of fact, all of his bones, his entire being would say, I love this frame to verse 10, all my bones shall say, Lord, who is like you? David promised that his entire being would be given in honor to God, who delivers the poor from him who is too strong to him. God would be praised in David's deliverance. Now, he's going to go on in verse 11 through 14 and describe how he was kind to his adversaries. This is sort of expanding on the things that we saw in the previous verses, verses 6 and 7, about them coming against David without cause. Here he's going to expand on that thought. Look at it here, starting at verse 11 here of Psalm 35. We read, Fierce witnesses rise up. They ask me things that I do not know. They reward me evil for good to the sorrow of my soul. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled myself with fasting and my prayer would return to my own heart. I paced about as though he were my friend or brother. I bowed down heavily as one who mourns for his mother. You see that there in verse 12? David says, they reward me evil for good. David here is remembering the dishonor of his enemies. They gave him evil when he promised them good, and all of it was to the sorrow of his soul. Isn't it fascinating to think that when we read that line, they reward me evil for good. Oh, it was true of David. It was even more true of Jesus himself. And it was, of course, to the sorrow of his soul, true both of David and the greater son of David, Jesus the Messiah. To to be misunderstood or or to be made the deliberate target of false accusations, it's great sorrow. But you see, David did good for them. Look at verse 13. When they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. David describes some of the good that he did for his enemies. He showed remarkable love and concern for them when they were sick. And it made their problem his own. He made their problem his own. And he cared for them. Look at that verse 4. As though he were my own friend or brother. David here is remembering all the good that he did for them. Yet, yet, look now at verses 15 and 16. But in my adversity, they rejoiced and gathered together. Attackers gathered against me, and I did not know it. They tore at me and did not cease with ungodly mockers at feasts. They gnashed at me with their teeth. Now, David treated these enemies well in their adversity, but but not them. Them, they rejoiced in David's adversity. They were happy when David was in a time of crisis. And he says here, verse 15, attackers gathered against me and I did not know it. The attacks from David's enemies were even worse because they were hidden to David. They came upon him as a surprise. And so now David cries out to the Lord, verses 17 and 18. Lord, how long will you look on? Rescue me from their destructions, my precious life from the lions. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. I will praise you among many people. David here is speaking very honestly before God. He's admitting that he felt God was passive and indifferent. Hey, hey Lord, when are you going to get busy? How long will you look on? He begged God for a rescue in his distress, which was so bad that David felt, and of course he's speaking metaphorically, but he felt in this symbolic way that lions were after him. But he says, Lord, if you will deliver me, when you will deliver me, verse 18, I will give you thanks in the great assembly. 
David vowed that he would give God the glory for his deliverance and that he would do so publicly before everybody. So now, David's going to pray for vindication. Look at this starting at verse 19. Ready? Let them not rejoice over me, who are wrongfully my enemies, nor let them wink with the eye who hate me without a cause. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful matters against the quiet ones in the land. They also opened their mouth wide against me and said, Aha! Aha! Our eyes have seen it. This you have seen, O Lord. Do not keep silence, O Lord. Do not be far from me. In verse 19, David continues his prayer. He says, Lord, let them not rejoice over me who are wrongfully my enemies. Lord, these people are my enemies without cause. So don't let them triumph over me. Don't don't let them rejoice over me. Because look at them. Verse 20, they devise deceitful matters against the quiet ones in the land. Lord, vindicate me against my enemies. They are plotting against God's humble, simple people. Now, the German Luther Bible, I suppose maybe it was Luther's original translation, it translates the phrase, the quiet ones in the land, with this phrase, die stillem in Lande. Now, that later became a phrase to describe believers in Germany, die stillen im Lande, especially those from the pietistic tradition. What they emphasized was living a quiet, devoted life of peace before God and man and trusting in God to defend them, just as is described here in Psalm 35. But I like that. The quiet ones in the land. Again, in German, it sounds pretty awesome too. Die Stillem in Lande. But again, what a beautiful idea it is that this is we can be God's quiet ones. We don't need to make a big noise on earth necessarily. We can make a big noise in heaven. We can be the quiet ones in the land. I like what F.B. Meyer said about this. F.B. Meyer said, quote, In every age God has had his quiet ones, retired from its noise and strife, withdrawn from its ambitions and jealousies, unshaken by its alarms, because they had entered into the secret of a life hidden in God. Now, David just Please and God, Lord, protect, protect the quiet ones in the land. Verse 22, this you have seen, O Lord. O Lord, do not be far from me. Again, this is David's plea to God. Interestingly, in verse 22, using two different names for God in the Hebrew text, th- these two different names are often translated into English by one word. The, the one word is Lord. But in verse 22, we see two different Hebrew words that are both translated Lord. The first one, this you have seen, O Lord, and Lord there is in all capital letters. That translates the Hebrew word Yahweh. It's the covenant name of God. It's the God of Israel. Again, the covenant name of the triune God. Then in verse 22, the other phrase, it says, O Lord, do not be far from me. That that Lord, with regular letters, translates the Hebrew word Adonai. That's the ancient Hebrew word for Lord. Now, sometimes, just like in Old English, Adonai has the sense of Sir, and sometimes it has a sense of God, depending on the context. But this is his reliance. This you have seen, O Lord. Lord, this is our confidence. I love the difference here. In verse 21, David says, that the enemies of God say, oh, our eyes have seen it. And then David answers it back to God in verse 22. This you have seen, O Lord. You know, whatever God's enemies claim to see, God sees a situation far, far better. So because of all this, David is going to make his plea unto God for divine vindication. Look at this here in verse 23. Stir up yourself and awake to my vindication. To my cause, my Lord and my God, or my God and my Lord. Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness, and let them not rejoice over me. Let them not say in their hearts, Ah, 
so we would have it. Let them not say, we have swallowed him up. Let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor who exalt themselves against me. Well, here in this section here, uh, verses 23 all the way through verse 26, we see David rising up once again and saying, God, get them. I mean, look at that phrase in verse 23, stir yourself up and awake to my vindication. David was confident that he was on God's side in his contention with his enemies. Yet, he longed for God to actively vindicate him. It seemed to him that God was too passive. So David cried out for him to stir up yourself and to awake on David's behalf. And so he cries out to God, verse 24, my God and my Lord. Now we saw in verse 22 that the names for God, Yahweh, were used, Lord with all capital letters. Uh, Adonai was used, Lord in regular letters. Now in verse 24, we have two other words or two additional words. My God, Elohim, that's the generic word for God in the plural, Elohim, my God and my Lord, back to Adonai. So again, my God and my Lord. By the way, doesn't this remind you of what Thomas cried out when he saw the wounds of Jesus. He says, my Lord and my God. When Thomas said that in John chapter 20, he very clearly understood that Jesus is God. He's using the same terminology from Psalm 35. It's a beautiful idea here. How clearly Thomas and the disciples understood that Jesus was not just a great man, not just a noble man, but that he himself was God. Verse 26, let them be ashamed and brought to mutual confusion who rejoice at my hurt. David just simply and powerfully asked God to be his defense before his enemies. And it's probably a good place for us to talk about this. I mean, how should we as believers regard all this? Is it okay for us to pray these imprecatory psalms, these psalms that basically say, Lord, get them. Lord, Lord, defeat them. Lord, let them be ashamed. Let them be dishonored. Let them be brought to mutual confusion. Are these okay prayers for us to pray? I'm going to say it this way. As believers, yes, these are okay prayers for us to pray. Let me explain why. Number one, When we feel anger, and let's just be honest here, let's just put it out on the table. When we feel hatred against other people, we need to bring that to God and bring it to him honestly. There is no point in you, when you're filled with anger or hatred against somebody, just saying, oh Lord, you know, I just love this brother and I pray that you would bless them. What is that? That's crazy. That's silly. Be honest before God. If you are filled with anger and hatred towards somebody, I'm sure you think your anger and hatred is justified. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But it's fine for you to be honest with it before God. That's number one. But number two, instead of taking vengeance or or retribution or the bringing of shame and dishonor, instead of taking that into your own hands, commit it to God in prayer. Lord, you get them. Lord, you bring them to confusion. Lord, you defeat them. Lord, you dishonor them. And then you know what you do? Then you wipe your hands and say, okay, God, now it's your business, not mine. That is a way to honor the heart of the scriptures when it simply says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Vengeance belongs to God. We, we, We shouldn't be trying to take it into our own hands. So these imprecatory Psalms have a real place for the believer today both as a way of showing that we can be honest before God, even with our anger and our hatred. But secondly, we can leave our desire for retribution and vengeance before God and let Him take care of it or not take care of it as He knows in His wisdom, His will, and His holiness what should be done. Now, Verses 27 and 28, end the psalm. He says, Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. And let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. 
and my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. David looks out among the people of God and simply says, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause. You see, through the Psalms in general, we see that David did not think of himself as perfect in some kind of sinless sense. Yet in many of the disputes that he had with his enemies, David had no problem in seeing that he was on God's side and they were not. In many of these conflicts, we don't sense that David was troubled by self-doubt. That's why he says, hey, if you favor my righteous cause, then rejoice when God wins the victory for me. Indeed, verse 7, 27, let the Lord be magnified. I think it's fascinating because in this Psalm, Psalm 35, David speaks a lot about his own need, a lot about his own trouble. Yet he ends with a strong focus on God and on his praise. He thought of the people of God making God bigger in their heart and their mind, because that's what it means to magnify something. When you magnify something, you you don't actually make the object bigger. You just make your perception of it bigger. And that's what David is saying here. He's saying, I'm making my perception of God bigger. I want you to make your perception of God bigger. And, And then we will continually praise him. As it says in verse 28, my tongue shall speak of your righteousness and of your praise all the day long. It's as if David says this, listen, my enemies wanted to magnify themselves. That's what it says in verse 26. They want to exalt themselves, but no, my desire is that God would be magnified. And God honored that desire on behalf of David as he brought his conflict to the Lord and left it there before him. All right, let's conclude with these thoughts. How does Psalm 35 point to Jesus? Well, there's a few ways that we've already mentioned. Let me just add three more. First of all, in verse 4, we read, Let those be put to shame and brought to dishonor who seek after my life. I want you to think how that prayer certainly was answered in regard to Jesus Christ. You know, the people who sought after the life of Jesus, Judas, the religious officials, Pontius Pilate, they have all been brought to dishonor, great dishonor, brought to shame. And we see that that prayer was powerfully, even ultimately answered in regard to Jesus. Secondly, in verse 13, we read, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. And David goes on in the following verses to describe how kind and thoughtful he was towards his own enemies in their time of need. And this is like a foreshadowing, a prophecy of the perfect sympathy of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. It's the sympathy that he has for us, even those who are his enemies. He loved us. He cared for us. He blessed us. He protected us even when we were his enemies. And and if you're far from God now, you know, I, I don't know why someone who does not yet believe would be watching this or listening to this. But if this is you, if for some reason you, you're just hearing my words at this moment, I want you to know, even when you have rejected Jesus and been his enemy, He has loved you. He has cared for you. He has blessed you. Just like David spoke of what he did for his enemies in verse 13 of Psalm 35. Don't despise that. Do do you see how wrong it is for you to reject Jesus who has loved you so and done so much for you, even while, maybe I should say, especially while you were yet his enemy. So we see these two ways that those who opposed Jesus were brought to shame and dishonor, just as David prayed in verse 4. We see in verse 13 that um, Jesus loved his enemies, just like David described. But let me give one final way that Psalm 35 points to Jesus, and I think this is very powerful. In verse 19, we read this line. They who hate me without a cause. Do you realize that Jesus quoted this line from Psalm 35, verse 19? 
He quoted it in John chapter 15, verse 25. It's really remarkable here. This is what it says in John 15, 25. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled, which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. David understood, excuse me, Jesus understood that what David wrote in Psalm 35, verse 19, was powerfully and perfectly fulfilled in Jesus himself. Because there's no doubt about it. The people who hated David in his day, the people he was writing about when he originally wrote Psalm uh, Psalm 35, they, they hated him without a cause. But how perfectly true that was of Jesus. Because maybe along the way, somebody would have a cause for hating David. How about this? Um, uh, I'm a Philistine and you killed my relative Goliath. (laughs) That might be some cause to hate David. But listen, Jesus never in any way gave somebody a righteous occasion to hate him. No way. Everybody who hates Jesus hates him without a cause. And so we see verse 19 pointing towards Jesus quoted by Jesus, fulfilled by Jesus in a powerful way. Let's pray in conclusion here. Father, we know it's true that anybody who hates Jesus really hates him without cause, without justified cause, without good cause. But Lord, we're also amazed that you love us without cause. At least there's no cause in us. Thank you for the love without cause that we have in Jesus Christ that you've given to us. And may we bring all of our frustration, all of our anger, Lord, whatever bitterness there may be, or even hatred in our heart towards other people. May we lay it down before you and leave it with you as David did here in Psalm 35. We thank you and praise you. You, the one who has been hated without cause, but also loves without cause. We praise you for it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.